Welcome to the talk series of DPD accredited webinars. My name is Taryn Seegers and I am the communications coordinator for CHOC Childhood Cancer Foundation. As you might know, it's CHOC's mission is to support children and teenagers with cancer or a life-threatening blood disorder, as well as their families. And by doing this, we improve the early detection and we facilitate the effective treatment. CHOC offers comprehensive child and family support through our different programs, which include psychosocial, emotional, and practical support. And we do this as we augment the different medical fraternities. Every time a child is diagnosed with cancer, it is a life-changing journey for the family. And we believe that although it is not preventable, it is curable. In September 2018, the World Health Organization launched the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, and with the goal of reaching at least a 60% survival rate. If we do this, and if this is successfully implemented, we could approximately reach 1 million additional children. And as part of CHOC's awareness and training education program, we host monthly CPD accredited talks, such as this one. So we'd like to welcome everybody to this talk today. And in addition, we'd like to thank the SACCSG who voluntarily give up their time to support these webinars. Today's conversation is with Prof Kruger. She's a professor and head of department in pediatrics, and this is in Stellenbosch University. In addition to this, she's also the co-principal director of the South African Research and Ethics Training Initiative in KwaZulu-Natal, and she's also the honorary professor in the School of Applied Human Sciences. And under her leadership, she's actively recruited Africans from all over Africa to train as pediatricians, subspecialists, and one of her PhD departments since 2012 quite a mouthful prof. She regularly visits local and universe, overseas universities and is a guest professor or lecturer in regard to teaching and participation in association bodies and committees. And we are really honored to have her here today. Her talk is about retinoblastoma and I'm very excited to introduce her and would like to welcome you prof. Thank you very much Sarah for this wonderful um, <laughs> Uh, presentation and also for the invitation to talk both you and Audrey and I think it is a wonderful initiative and I hope this will continue uh, with regular uh, and, and I I'm convinced that the SACCG members would love to assist in this way and make sure that we share everything. And thank you for inviting me to talk about retinoblastoma because that, that is probably the most important cancer for me and that I've spent most of my uh, career focusing on. Um, shall, with no further ado, I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, let me just see, make sure, um, can you see it, uh, Darren, is it working? Yes, we can see it. Let me just get thank it. You. Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much, yes, this is an overview for healthcare workers and I think this is a very important um, cancer to recognize because it is easily recognizable and uh, the wonderful news is it is also very curable. So I'll be talking a little bit about epidemiology, then go to genetics, clinical presentation, special investigation, uh, quite a bit about staging because it is a tumor that we need to stage very well. The pathology for those of you in the audience who are pathologists, look at what the current treatment strategies are. Uh, vision preservation is actually the utmost goal and then the way forward and some words on studies that uh, I've been the principal investigator of in both Cameroon and in South Africa and come to the conclusion. So if we look at the epidemiology, uh, retinoblastoma is a rare childhood cancer, uh, but it's a very, very curable disease if you diagnose it early. And so if you're living in a high income country, uh, nearly 100% in natural fact, 100% of children can survive a retinoblastoma. However, when we go to low and middle income countries, it is a usual story that we diagnose far more advanced disease and therefore survival is less than 30%. Um, we can say that it's the seventh most common childhood cancer globally and it's about two to 3% of all childhood cancers. It translates to about one child born in 15 to 20,000 of live births who will develop a retinoblastoma. Interesting uh, recent uh, publication uh, which I've added in the references for those who are interested, have documented that Asia has the majority of retinoblastomas at 53%. This is followed by Africa with 29% of all retinoblastomas, then Latin America about 8%, North America about 3%, and Europe about 6%. There's no racial or sex sexual differences, and usually we diagnose it in the first two years of life, 
where 95% of cases will be diagnosed before the five years of age. Uh, about a third of them will be bilateral, and this is usually the heritable form. And so if a parent is carrying the mutation in the RB1 gene, one in four of the offsprings will, can, will be diagnosed, and it's usually diagnosed before 12 months of age. So I think the important thing to realize that this is a genetically predetermined cancer, and it's interesting that Crutzen was, uh, Alfred Crutzen was an American physician and geneticist, and he already, on, on, based on modeling, uh, published his model in 1971 saying that this particular cancer probably de develops with a two-heat hypothesis, namely that there's two mutations necessary uh, on both alleles of a chromosome to cause a phenotypic change of cancer. And uh, it's interesting that he did this in 1971, but this could only be proven in 1986. So he really had a model of how to do this. Now, if you look at this, I've got a picture here. These are two alleles of one chromosome. And if it's a sporadic form, the both each will happen after birth. Uh, and it's demonstrated there in the little green on those chromosomes. And the person will develop a unilateral retinoblastoma. However, if it's inherited, and I will come back to this again, one comes from the parent, and then there's a second heat after birth, and the person then has bilateral and usually heritable form of retinoblastoma. Now, this mutation is happening on both alleles on chromosome 13 on the long arm position 1 to 4, and it's called the retinoblastoma 1 gene. It's also important to know that this translates or transcripts to a nuclear protein, which is both a tumor suppressor and size cycle regulator. So if there's loss of these uh, mutation, sorry, uh, just go back to the slide. If there's loss of this as, um, on both chromosomes, and you can see if it's a tumor suppressor, uh, it will not. It will actually lead to overgrowth of cells, and this is what's happening in retinoblastoma. Of course, this um, mutation is also associated with lung cancer and osteosarcoma. And so, as I've said, it's heritable. 50% chance of offspring inheriting from the parent will have a germline mutation. There's a very small number of cases, less than 3% of them, where there's no RB1 mutation, uh, but a MIC amplification, which can cause retinoblastoma, but it's really very rare. So just a nice um, uh, cartoon of it. You have a sporadic form, both alleles are normal, the child is born, then there's a first heat after birth, and then another acquired heat on the second heat, after it, and the child will develop a unilateral cancer, a retinoblastoma, versus a child with inherited form, where it's born with a germline mutation on the one allele of the chromosome 13, and then there's a second hit after birth. Now these both uh, alleles have lost that uh, part of the chromosome, and so now the child will develop um, retinoblastoma. So it's again, I just want to stress again, it's a tumor suppressor gene, so if you lose this gene, you are going to have overgrowth, and it's usually during the S phase. Uh, if you, some of you remember mitosis, and so the cells will in, uh, grow uncontrolled and release the retinoblastoma. Um, there's a, a autosomal dominant form, which is a 90% penetrance, but there are seemingly some that are familial that are a low penetrance, but the, uh, we don't have more data at the moment. So usually done in familial or bilateral, we have to do um, the genetics to see whether this is bilateral. It's especially important for siblings uh, because they need to have um, uh, examination under anesthesia if it's not done by genetics. So that saves a lot of cost if you can screen them beforehand and it's necessary in the first year of life. So how do they present? I mean, the most classic form, of course, is the classic white eye or leukocoria. Uh, or one can also say the absence of a, of a red reflex. The child can also, because the child cannot really see with that eye, uh, present with strabismus. Another form is rubiosis iridis, and all that means is that there's new vascularization of the iris with or without bleeding, and the child can also present with glaucoma. Unfortunately, lay diagnosis often leads to this kind of picture where you have a gross orbital extension called the thalmus, uh, you may have central nervous uh, involvement if it's spread into the brain. There can be local extent, 
uh, as you can see here, you can see this local extension with lymph node involvement, and you can have distant metastases with bone marrow involvement. Uh, if you have, especially bilateral, one has to exclude pinealoblastoma, which is sitting in the brain in the hypophysis, uh, which can be also due to retinoblastoma. So what are the investigations that we do? The first is a very complete history, because in this case, you have to make sure that there's no family member that is affected or and know that it's not inherited. And then one does a baseline high resolution magnetic resonance imaging of the brain and the orbits, the specifically to exclude the pinealoblastoma in the brain or any optic nerve involvement, because that means that it's more advanced disease. Uh, the necessary full complete blood counts need to be done because you need to know that the bone marrow is not involved and also it's important for the treatment later and that in, uh, kidney function is normal. And we usually go over to examination under anesthesia. Uh, and if you're fortunate and your hospital has a red cam, they can take good pictures under anesthesia of the particular cancer and see how they progress on treatment. However, uh, for those without a red cam, they, they usually the ophthalmologist will draw little pictures to tell you exactly what the cancer looks like. And as I've said, genetics is advisable if available. We have it not readily available in South Africa, and so it is rather kept for research purposes or those families where it looks as if it may be an inheritable form. So the next step then is to correctly stage the patient. And this is really uh, crucial in retinoblastoma because it does determine what kind of treatment you are going to give and to make sure that it's optimal treatment with, that you start giving to the child. There are several staging systems that have been developed uh, for the, in the last 50 years. And so well resourced countries usually use only the intraocular staging system because they have early diagnosis and they do not um, have to spend time on, on, on advanced disease. However, uh, we in low and middle income countries are often late, uh, seeing late diagnosis and need an extraocular staging system. None of the systems that I'm going to present have really been truly validated, but the one that I'm going to discuss in, the, in depth is the International Retinoblastoma Staging System, as well as the International Interocular Retinoblastoma Staging System, because in a sense, it was developed for countries uh, such as uh, South America and Africa and Asia, uh, where you can have anything from intraocular to advanced disease. So if we just look at it, I'm not going to do it in depth, but I'm just going to say intraocular, we divide into five categories. There's a group A, a group B, group C, group D, and group E. Group A is very low, and you usually uh, have uh, tumors that are only three millimeters or smaller. Um, you have group B, that's low risk, where you have no vitreous or subretinal receding. You have group C with a moderate increased risk because you now have vocal focal vitreous or subretinal seeding. Group D is high risk where there's diffuse vitreous or subretinal seeding and or massive non-discreet endophytic or exophytic disease. And in group E, which is very high risk, uh, the eyes actually have been destroyed anatomically or functionally, and it's really not able to see anymore and it's irreversible um, uh, damage that the cancer has done to the eye. So if we look at the uh, international retinoblastoma staging for uh, more advanced disease. When it's only intraocular, it's a stage zero, and the patient can be treated conservatively. If it's a stage one disease, um, the, it is it's more extensive. It's a group E and, and um, involvement of the optic nerve, but not to the uh, excision line. And the eye needs to be enucleated, uh, which is all then lead to completely restricted histologically. Stage two is an eye where you have still microscopic residual disease, and this is usually where the tumor is still into the excision line of the optic nerve. Stage three can be divided into an A and B, where you have regional extension. A is the overt orbital disease, uh, of which I've shown a picture earlier, and B is where you have pre ulacular or cervical lymph node extension. Uh, this regional extension goes into the brain and with the optic nerve respect into the brain. Uh, or to the left of meninges. And then stage four is metastatic disease, again, A and B. B is central nervous system where you have um, a pre-chiasmatic lesion or central nervous system mass or left meningeal or serospinal fluid disease. And uh, 
uh, A is where you have uh, uh, bone marrow involvement. It can be single or multiple lesions, but usually these children present with an anemia and with a, or, and or with a pancytopenia. So just what are the other systems? I've discussed the international routine of the system with you. And as you can see, there's five stages and seven sub-stages for the intraocular disease. It does not include fundoscopy findings. It correlates with disease-free survival, especially the scleral involvement. And you can identify patients with high risk for extraorbital relapse with this system. And it has pathological prognostic factors. And a system that's very often used in the North America is the TNM system. It has 16 substages. It can be divided into a pathology staging or a clinical staging system. Uh, it includes the fundoscopy findings. And again, uh, one of the critique against it is that it omits clearer involvement, uh, which is uh, associated with poor disease for survival. So, um, and it is a much more complex one. And for Africa, where we don't always have good uh, pathology services, it's a very complex one to try and attempt to do, and it's easier to use the international retinoblastoma staging system. The old system was Grabowski and Abramson in the 60s, had four stages and 12 substages, also omitted choroidal involvement, which also is associated with poor disease free survival. And then there's a modified centrioid, which doesn't differ that much from the international one. It has four stages and 12 substages. Uh, it correlates with poor disease free survival. However, it uh, omits a post laminar involvement, uh, but they, they did not find any correlation uh, with disease free survival. Uh, and again, this system identified patients with risk, high risk for extraorbital relapse. So these are the two preferred systems, the first and the last, if you're going to use it. The Grabowski and Abramson has actually gone out of fashion because it doesn't really help us with determining who has high, uh, a poor prognosis. So if we look at the pathology, uh, it's the classic blue cell, uh, small blues around blue cell cancers, uh, as we associate with quite a number of solid tumors in childhood. It's small hypochromatic cells. Uh, and as you can see, with a high nuclear to cytoplasmic uh, ratio, there are large, can be large areas of necrosis, and there can also be calcifications. Now that uh, we differentiate into well differentiated retinoblastoma, and they classically have homorhytrosis, and you can see here homorhytrosis, they have a nice pink nucleus, and they're sort of larger. And then the poorly differentiated uh, flexor when they're steiner, this is just the people who named them, reset. and here you can see they've got a very white. Um, uh, nucleus in the middle, and they're smaller resets, and that is sort of fully differentiated. And there's recently, in, in 2014, the new resets found in, uh, which is unusual and usually found in the anterior segment. Uh, but now we don't commonly use this. We usually look for these kind of uh, resets on the pathology. Then necrosis can be graded as none, which is less than 25%, or mild, which is 25 to 50%, or extensive, which is more than 50%. We then, in pathology, which is crucial for treatment purposes, look at whether there's an optic nerve invasion and whether this is pre-laminar, post-laminar, or invasion of the resected margin. So pre-laminar is still very good prognosis and still at stage one. The minute it is post-laminar and invasion of the resected margin, it becomes um, stage two disease or more. And then one has to also classify the choroidal involvement, whether it's focal invasion less than three millimeters in diameter or massive invasion and more than three millimeters because that is, has prognostic implications and can easily relapse. So what are the high risk factors then? We look at massive choroidal in, invasion, which you can see in this case. We look at the uh, laminar involvement of whether there's retrolaminar invasion of the optic nerve, which you can see here. And so it's very important to look at the iris and ciliary, uh, sorry, my slides jump. Ciliary body involvement, you look for anterior chamber involvement. Uh, you need to look for scleral involvement uh, and because that's a greater risk of orbit recurrence and or metastases. And so the, you can find high risk phase, uh, factors have been reported as between seven to 56% of IH. But what is important is that usually poorly differentiated cancers retinoblastomas are associated with older age 
and have a worse prognosis. So it's really crucial to diagnose early. So I'm going to start off with a treatment for intraocular retinoblastoma. This is usually when you have very localized disease. Um, <clears throat> and that's just a brief word. I mean, the treatment of, of retinoblastoma is really complex, and I will come back to it at the end, and it's really very individualized. You cannot just make one recipe for everybody. So one has to really carefully look at how the particular child's eye is responding to the particular treatment given. So the first is the local therapy that we provide for those that have um, uh, group A to C intraocular disease. There you can get away with cryotherapy, which is very reliable and actually quite often uh, uh, available throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. You do indirect ophthalmoscopy and you treat the peripheral lesions with a cryotherapy probe, uh, which you put onto the cranial tiba for the peripheral lesions. If you have posterior located lesions, you're going to make a conjunctural incision and you're going to put it on the skewer and freeze it. And it's a triple freeze thaw technique, and it can be in, used in combination with some sort of chemotherapy if you want to reduce the size, especially if it's uh, larger than, uh, 0 .3, uh, than 3 millimeters or quite thick. But the complications that you can find with um, cryotherapy is, of course, retinal detachment, so your ophthalmologist has to be very skilled in using cryotherapy. Another form of therapy which has replaced the previous uh, use in the 60s of external beam radiotherapy is transpillary thermotherapy, uh, which is now used rather than laser therapy as a primary treatment for tumors smaller than three millimeters in diameter and less than three millimeters in thickness. It's a nice, easy treatment every two to six sessions per four week interval but you can get complications such as iris atrophy or a senique or a focal cataract. But very, very good for cancers A to C, if you remember what I've said, it's very small intraocular disease and easy to manage. <coughs> Sorry, just the word. <clears throat> we come to plague therapy, which was developed in the United States and of which Professor Clay Stanard has become the expert in South Africa and has taught the UCT colleagues how to do this. This is usually used as secondary treatment for more medium-sized lesions that are still less than 16 millimeter in the largest basal diameter, but larger than three millimeters and smaller than nine millimeters in thickness. And it's usually those um, localized intraocular disease that's not sensitive to chemotherapy uh, or does not respond to other therapy. It can be with or without vitreous or subretinal feeding. And it's usually where you see a recurrence of the intravenous or intraarterial chemotherapy. Uh, we can also use it for diffuse anterior segment retinoblastoma with or without uh, intravenous chemotherapy in the absence of choroidal or retinal tumors. Uh, the isotope used is usually iodine 125, and your dose is about 35 to 40 G to the tumor apex. This is usually done one to two months following intravenous chemotherapy to minimize side effects. Usually very convenient therapy. It takes only two to four days to deliver. It prevents a facial hyperplasia that you get with external beam radiotherapy, and it also prevents cancers. And you actually then target specifically the lesion and you protect the other structures with a gold plate. And it has up to 79% success rate. Side effect is that you can again get cataracts or maculopathy or radiation papillopathy, and you can also get a lead into the vitreous. Intraarterial chemotherapy is now indicated for group C, D, and E, and it's usually now practiced in high end countries. For many, many, many years, we didn't have it, but now more and more we have ophthalmologists that are now skilled and trained to do this in South Africa. We specifically get it at the uh, University of Cape Town and as well as in Johannesburg at WITS. But there are also a couple of private uh, radio ophthalmologists that I've heard about who are now trained in, in doing this. This is specifically indicated for, as primary therapy for non germline unilateral group B, C, D, or E retinoblastoma, where you think you can save the vision and where you think you can cure, cure the cancer. Um, it is a secondary therapy for unilateral or bilateral advanced resistant disease where you are facing initiation, especially bilateral disease, where you want to see if you can keep one eye 
uh, with vision at least for the particular child. It has side effects such as periorbital edema, uh, it can have cutaneous hyperemia, uh, blepharoptosis, scalp hair loss, and extraocular dysmotility. Uh, very serious events can also happen, such as occlusion, uh, occlusive vasculopathy, or a renal, retinal artery occlusion with blindness. So that can happen. And long term, you can have quite a lot of retinal scarring with a reduction in visual field or visual acuity, especially if it involves the macula. Another form of therapy that's also being used in high income countries is intravitreal chemotherapy. And this is really for refractory or retinal vitreous seeds following other treatments. It's never a primary therapy, but in a combination for these vitreous seeds. And as I've said, it's mostly available in high income countries. And this is really when you're dealing with intraocular disease. Now, hopefully, as we uh, train healthcare workers to diagnose early, we will start focusing more on intraocular therapies, uh, while at the moment we're actually more focusing on advanced disease. So if we then come to advanced disease, it is all, all those group E tumors because group E has already functionally destroyed the eye. There's already poor tumor. Uh, you do it when you have poor tumor visualization, when you have extraocular ex extension, when you suspect an invasion of the optic nerve or the choroid, especially those resistant tumors where local therapies have failed, such as um, cryotherapy, thermal, uh, and, and all those other local therapies that I've just discussed. Uh, it, it has many complications because you can get all sorts of uh, problems with it because you are going to um, uh, deal with chemotherapy that you're going to give this patient. And so in the creation state, sorry about that. So, but I just want to say a brief word. In the creation in Africa still stays one of the most important forms for an eye that is so extensively damaged. And you've seen some of these huge tumors that are on the previous slide. So what we usually do is we will give preoperative chemotherapy to reduce it, to make the surgery less complicated so that you don't have these complications of enucleation as I've listed here. Um, and so you also want to have a good orbit to have an orbital pill implant because then you have a, 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 a artificial eye that can actually move with a normal eye, which is crucial for the child's normal development. And these children must get systemic chemotherapy. There's quite a number of regimens, but I've just put two on. The most commonly used one and the most effective one is vincristine etoposide carboplatin. But in countries where carboplatin is too expensive, an alternative is vincristine cyclophosphamide and adiamycin, and I will come back to it. So. I specifically for that, but this purpose want to come and focus on low middle income countries. So a couple of years ago, in 2012, 2013, we came together as a group in the International Society of Pediatric Oncology and Pediatric Oncology from developing countries, and we developed the adapted retinoblastoma management guidelines uh, for low and middle income countries. Now, in this particular context, we have to look at what are the local available resources for that particular treatment center and ensure that the child can get some form of treatment to be able to cure. And so what the first thing was to divide the settings according to the resources. That's a low income country at setting one, a low and middle income country at setting two, and a high income country at setting three. And you can go and look on the references. I've listed it here, but I just want to demonstrate in table one, we have the proposed system for how to diagnose them. If you look at setting one, we look at imaging. Do they have imaging available? Do they have oncology treatment available? Do they have ophthalmology? Do they have pathology? Do they have genetic testing? And what are the criteria for reclassification? So you'll see there's only low dose chemotherapy in setting one, and they will have minimal ophthalmologist and minimal pathology assessment. Setting two has chemotherapy with MRI, with local therapy such as cryotherapy, laser therapy. External beam radiotherapy. They do can pathologists can do limit risk assessment. Sorry, and setting three has everything. You can see that just all the resources that you can think of is available in setting three. So if we then go to the next slide, which is actually then how you decide what type of therapy to do. Again, we look at can they do chemotherapy support? Is there local ophthalmic therapy? Is there radiotherapy in the context? 
Is there palliative care available? Do they have pathology services? Do they have support services? <coughs> what type of imaging facilities are they? And do they have pediatric anesthesia? And you can see some of them will have only ultrasound, some will have CT scans and MRIs, just to highlight one example. <coughs> and here, I want to demonstrate the difference between two of these protocols. Now, the one here on the left is a study that I'm now finalizing the publication of uh, children treated for um, Retinoblastoma in South Africa in uh, nine of the 13 oncology centers with Vincristine, Otoposide, Carboplatin, and all the therapies are surgical and the local therapies uh, as indicated per stage. And on, uh, and on the left, I right, you see uh, the children in our twinning program uh, treated in Cameroon. It's a low income country. They have little resources that only uh, ultrasound available. Pathology was not always available and we, it's mostly nurse-driven. Uh, we treated them there with vincristine, adromycin, and cyclophosphamide because it was low cost and available. You can see on the right, left side, the South African overall survival was 78% versus the 50% in uh, Cameroon. However, we need to say that in Cameroon, because we didn't have a pathologist, they may, quite a number of children may have been diagnosed with a wrong stage. But if we look at stage zero, it was a similar survival rate. You can see this blue line here, 100%. If you come to stage one, 90% for South Africa, more than 80% for, uh, for Cameroon. Uh, the same is for stage grade two, was 80 82% in South Africa, and just below 80% for Cameroon. So in actual fact, for low stage disease, it was very really comparative. But where the difference came in was stage four, which is this yellow line, and stage three, we did far better in South Africa because we had local therapies available versus Cameroon, who had only chemotherapy and surgery. And you can see that they did worse. But so it is feasible. This proves actually that one can adapt uh, treatment protocols to increase survival. However, in this, um, there's a couple of problems which I want to discuss also further. So what are the challenges in low and middle income countries? I think the most important thing from our perspective is the lack of awareness, um, which results in the di delay diagnosis. And this includes both parents and healthcare workers. And it was interesting uh, in, in, in South America when they started addressing this issue and they wanted to see how they can improve it. Uh, one of the islands actually decided to ask all parents to take pictures of their babies under six months of age. And if they didn't see the red eye reflex on a camera, they needed to bring the child in for screening because that is a way of picking up retinoblastoma. And it's interesting if you ask our parents, a quite common history is to say that, yes, they took a baptism, baptism pictures and the baby didn't have a red eye reflex and they saw a white spot and they went to the clinic. And traditionally, both in Cameroon and in South Africa, the primary care clinics will be giving ointments and ointments for a couple of months and only when the, the tumor starts really becoming uh, extraorbital refer. So this is what we need to start preventing. Uh, fortunately, I can say that in South Africa, we're diagnosing earlier uh, because of all the awareness programs. And I must again stress that CHOC is extremely important in these awareness programs because they've actually undertaken to take it to the correct of the country with the help of the Department of Health. And so we are seeing uh, earlier diagnosis but that's not yet the case in uh, uh, Cameroon. So an easy thing like uh, looking for a red spot on a camera and if it's absent, telling parents to come and take their child for assessment is an easy way. And then we need to train our healthcare workers that if the mother complains about a white spot, we must get an ophthalmologist to see that child and examine that child and make sure that this is not retinal blastoma. Because if you can diagnose this disease within the first six months of life, it's actually only local therapy needed. The child keeps vision and the child is cured. The next thing, and this is also why there's a difference in stage one and two disease survival between Cameroon and South Africa is treatment refusal. And this is especially because parents refuse inoculation. Um, and this uh, delays appropriate treatment management. So when I started uh, with this work in 1993, when I came back from Belgium, and I had quite a lot of treatment refusals because it's a very strange concept 
to have to lose an eye or a limb in Africa. Um, and I was mainly working with uh, rural communities. Um, I started preoperative chemotherapy to uh, let the parents adjust. And so it is extremely important that we address recruitment refusal, find ways to address that. The next uh, difficult one is actually the lack of local therapy. If you don't have an ophthalmologist who can do an enucleation or do laser therapy, then it really actually limits what you can do. But of course, now that we are developing and improving our care, we need to have access to intra-arterial chemotherapy. And um, I've also listed the chemotherapy. There's quite large parts of Africa still where the National Department of Health do not sponsor chemotherapy for patients and specifically not for children. Uh, the Cameroon program worked uh, mainly on relations from the United Kingdom and the Swiss League. It wasn't bought by their government. It was in Baptist mission hospitals. So that is still a big struggle in, in, in Africa. And then, of course, uh, South Africa has a health care system, and we want to embark on a national health care plan. Uh, that is very uh, good if we can achieve and afford it. However, in the majority of sub-Saharan Africa countries, parents have to pay themselves. So the cost of the health care interventions may be just too expensive. And this was, again, a reason in Cameroon where we sometimes had to wait for enucleation because initially we didn't have sponsorship for the enucleation part. The parents had to pay for the surgery themselves. And so we had to go and collect the funding. Uh, fortunately, the Swiss League actually gave us a donation uh, to sponsor the enucleations, and we could do it earlier, and that improved the outcome uh, later on. Then, uh, sorry, then again, you have the lack of health, skilled healthcare workers, which we are all familiar with, and in this context in Africa, and even in South Africa, it is specifically dedicated pathologists who are used to diagnosing retinoblastoma. And so we need to work on making sure that we have access to good pathologists, and especially as we've seen from the complexity of the staging system, it's very important that you have a good pathologist to assist you. Another issue is a lack of prosthetic eyes uh, because you want the child to develop normally. You don't want to have a skew phase. And if you don't have a, a prosthetic eye in the orbit, that orbit will not grow normally. And you have to change it as a child gets older with a bigger prosthesis at the same size of the normal eye to make sure that they grow symmetrically. And that is also a major issue. And then the lack of support structures to support the families, because um, again, it's a very difficult thing if you suddenly have a child who's lost an eye, um, and uh, they, they, they are sometimes, I've had families who were scared to go return back to their homes because they were scared the child will not be accepted by their communities. So one has to create that support structures. What has worked for me in my life was to use patients that have cured from their retinoblastoma and to then um, get those parents to come and sit with newly diagnosed parents and explain to them exactly what's going to happen and how it should take place. Um, and that is really crucial that we support these families because it's devastating to first of all hear your child's got a cancer and then second of all when you hear that you're going to do mutilating surgery. And if we can have groups of parents that have gone through this to come and sit down with newly diagnosed parents, it actually helps with the treatment refusal issue that I've got here uh, as, as listed number two. And it supports the families through that and you get to your correct treatment as soon as possible. Um, and one of the other things that one has is also, and I think I'm going to mention it later, is that you get families that start shopping with the South African protocol. When I started analyzing the data that the unit have sent to me, I've picked up quite a number of children that would say, I diagnosed in Chris Arne Barakwana, and then suddenly went to Bloemfontein and didn't like what Bloemfontein was saying and ended up with us in Tigerberg or in Cape Town. And by that time, usually came from a stage one disease to a stage four disease. So uh, a shopping of treatment centers has happened in South Africa. So one of the lessons that I've learned uh, through this process, I think uh, having dealt with it, and I can't state it enough, good communication between the multidisciplinary team members is extremely important for the success of this. As you can see, in this particular uh, disease, you, you cannot rely only on the oncologist or only on the ophthalmologist or only on the uh, pathologist or on the radiotherapist. It's really a combination of, of communication between the team members. 
we have to prevent lay diagnosis and, and unrecognized retinal thermos. And this is where our primary health care team members are becoming part of this multidisciplinary team because they're the first to actually recognize this is a childhood cancer, it's got to be referred. The next one is in incorrect staging when we do not have enough pathologists that are skilled to do this or a lack of pathologists. And I've had quite a number of, of ophthalmologists who would initiate the eye, not send it for pathology, and that was specifically in my beginning years in the 90s uh, and in early 2000s in South Africa, uh, but also still in Cameroon. They see a child, they see the eyes, they initiate the eye and they send the parents home. And then a couple of months later, the child comes back with metastatic disease. So non-referral for further management is another crucial issue. Then a delay in the initiation of chemotherapy when indicated uh, for whatever reason may be, whether parents are refusing or whether there's a lack of therapy is also important. The pathology service, uh, I think I've stressed enough. And then it's important that we use a standardized staging system and this is why I propagated the moment the International Retinal Blastoma Staging System that we all use and have, that we've reached consensus on. <coughs> and then uh, parental initial treatment refusal, extremely important to note that there may be treatment shopping. Make sure that when you send the patient out who is refusing uh, for whatever reason, because what they do is they, they just disappear. Make sure that they have some kind of summary already with them, so that when they do pitch at the new center, the new center do not have to start all over again, but rather can see what you've already done. So this is again, rather than wait till they discharge, give them a summary uh, when you break the, di di the news to them and when you diagnose it, and think in terms of them that they may want to go shopping, uh, as I call it, and go to other units, and rather alert your colleagues that this is a potential and make sure the parent has some kind of summary with it. And it is something important to stop. So then we come to the long-term follow-up. It is crucial that we follow up these children for, for life. Uh, this is especially those who have bilateral disease or ger proven germline mutations, because they do have a risk of second cancer. Now, it is usually retinal blastoma only relapses within the first three years. So it's definitely important to see them every year for the first three years. But thereafter, it's really going to be a local relapse or a metastatic relapse, uh, although there are cases up to 11 years later, but it's really rare. So it is important to, to then rather follow them up at least every two years uh, for uh, the risk of a second cancer. However, I must say, I remember one case that we had, one patient we had, he had retinal blastoma before the age of three. If we developed a second retinal blastoma, um, uh, unrelated to the first one, uh, 11 years later, and he subsequently died of a, another cancer. So he did die of a second cancer. So it's important to think of that. And then crucial is ophthalmology uh, follow-up that is necessary with secondary to the cancer treatment, because they may have quite a number of problems because of the underlying treatment. They may have amblyopathy, uh, which is a, a slow eye, not really moving with the other eye. They may develop glaucoma. They may develop cataracts, they may have bleeding in the vitreous, and they're also more prone to retinal detachment. And since it's their vision, it is very crucial that we early diagnosis and ophthalmologists can address these issues to maintain and preserve vision as far as possible, because that's the whole purpose. If you want to got them to survive, you have to really make sure that you improve their vision as far as possible. Um, so in conclusion, retinal blastoma is a very complex disease. It is very important that each patient is individualized uh, with regard to their treatment. It's crucial to note that this is a multidisciplinary team, and I forgot to add the primary health care workers, but they're actually part of this team. It starts with the primary health care workers, it starts, then the ophthalmologists, the pediatric oncologists, and the radio therapists. We should have national regional management programs so that we have similar treatment and harmonize and make sure that we audit our outcome continuously and improve and diagnose earlier to preserve our vision and make sure our children can grow normally because that's the most important thing is vision preserve, preservation for this. And I thought I'll just uh, share a final anecdote about one family uh, where the father, for some reason, did have initiation before the age of three. He absolutely always refused to come to the hospital, so we never saw him. 
But when we diagnosed his oldest child with a unilateral disease, uh, he had um, stage four disease and he did subsequently two years later die. But the baby was two months old. We did examination under anesthesia and he had bilateral retinoblastoma and he survived his cancer. But the father could not believe that he, this child inherited it from him and he thought it was the wife. So he left this wife, he got another wife and three years down the line, we had another unilateral uh, retinoblastoma, this time a little girl and it was the same father. So please keep good history taking and take note because we still have a lot of um, parents that are not believing when they say it's an inherited disease. It is a difficult concept for them but we have to share this. And with that, I'm going to end and say, I hope there's some questions. I have a couple of crucial uh, references that I thought is interesting for those who want to read about further about it. Uh, I think particularly important, if I can just go back, is um, anything done by Carol Shield, because she has been passionate. She's roughly, I think, in the late 70s, early 80s, but she's been passionate about retinoblastoma all along. And she's really important to take note of for anybody who wants to read about it. And again, with this, I want to say thank you very much to Chuck for making these webinars available to staff members. And thank you very much for all of you who have come today and have participated. And with this, thank you. Prof, thank you so, so much. That was, that was amazing. It really was. I really enjoy all of these webinars where when you leave, you actually have more questions than anything else. Um, and I think it's vital to know that the early warning signs are really incredibly important. Um, and these are always available on the CHOC website. So that is really good to know. So always have a look at these. And then once again, if you ever spot any of these early warning signs to always go to your the proper medical practitioners who are involved in any of these cancers or life threatening blood disorders. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Prof, we really appreciate your time. Once again, thank you to everybody for joining us today. We hope you learned something. We hope you took something away. I see there's no questions, but if there's anything, you're always welcome to pop us an email. And then the next webinar, we have Dr. Jacques van Heerden. It's on the 6th of July, and we'll be discussing neuroblastoma. So please make sure you register on the CHOC website. And for any other webinars coming up, you're welcome to pop up a message or just register for any of those coming up. Thank you, everybody, for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thanks, Prof. Thank you.